How's it going, my quarantine friends? Uh, Anthony Wiegand here, scenic designer and scenic charge in Philadelphia. Well, up until the recent pandemic, um, week seven, eight of quarantine, I'm not really sure. But uh, today I'm back here doing another video for Theater Horizon. Shout out to them for keeping us busy. Uh, today we're going to go over a few different wood graining techniques that you can use to apply to furniture or panels, whatever you want to do. Um, but it should be fun. Let's have a look. So we have whatever surface we're working on. For me, this is like a two foot by three foot piece of masonite. Uh, in fact, if you saw my other video, the marble is actually on the back of it. What we're doing today is a little bit of wood grain. Um, what I'm gonna end up doing is making this into four separate panels and showing you some different techniques that you can do within sort of the same feeling of wood grain. Uh, but again, I have a an example that I'm kind of basing my wood grain off of. It's always helpful to have a visual reference in front of you. Um, Probably the hardest thing about wood grain is that you have to learn to see through the layers. We're going to put three or four layers of paint on this. So this color, while it is kind of warm orange now, if we paint that as our base coat and then we apply all of our other coats on top, it'll end up becoming really dark. So we're going to use a little bit of a lighter base. This is pretty typical when doing wood grain because um, you have to imagine all this wood is stained. It all comes wood color to begin with. So I have here kind of like a um, yellowy beigey orange and we're gonna do some white and we might even throw some raw umber in this. Oh, that's not looking very good. Uh, might throw some raw umber in this just to give it a little bit of dirtiness, we'll see. But before we start that, I want to introduce you to a few tools. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a chip brush. And a knife. And we're going to cut the chip brush so that we end up with bristles that will essentially line up to these grains. Um, I just want to show you this first before we get started so you can prep your surface. Don't let me not do it on here. So what you want to do, put this down and we're going to cross, cut little X's through the bristles essentially. We want to lose probably two thirds of the hair on this brush. You could probably also do this with scissors to get you started. I like the knife a little bit better because it's a little less even, but if you were to chop, at least get you started in these little X. And then we'll finish it off with the knife. Okay, see that? And you can keep going, depending on what type of wood grain you're is, you know, usually in a shop I'll have five or six brushes I would also say that if you have any crappy chip brushes already, brushes that you've uh, you've left a little bit of paint in or just have a good amount of use, go ahead and cut them up. They'll actually work a little bit better because uh, they're stiffer. Mine is a little bit new, so I might have a little bit of trouble with this, but I mean, they're also a dollar, so I'm not too concerned about the longevity of a chip brush. We'll make some more adjustments to that later, but you get the idea. All right, the next tool I want to introduce you to is a wood graining tool. And that's how we're going to get these rings, essentially, is what they are in real life. But that's how we're going to mimic those rings. So I bought a Warner graining tool from Lowe's. It cost about seven bucks. Uh, Home Depot didn't have any. You can get some online, but if you do get them online, just read the reviews and, and see what it's made of. This is a rubbery type of material, and it is really good at keeping your flow nice. They sell a version of this on Amazon that's red, that's plasticky, uh, or just a much harder rubber. Don't buy it. It sucks. You will throw it away. Great. So, um, this is shaped like a thumbprint. This is going to take a little bit of practice, but essentially what we're going to do is if this is, you know, if this is our workpiece, we're going to drag 
paint through while rocking the brush or grainer back and forth. We'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, it is going to take some practice. It's kind of kind of crazy to how it works, but all right. So as I said before, we're going to end up putting like a brown top coat on this or orangey. Uh, so I want to think about what color the base needs to be to make that happen. And we're not going for perfection here, so I'm not going to stress about it too much. So the first technique we're going to be using is called a directional wet blend. Uh, it's very simple. It's basically just applying two colors at the same time. Um, if you watched my last video, we did a scumble, which is sort of an X shape. This we're just going to be working back and forth. Now, because this is wood grain, you want to be very careful just to make sure that you're keeping your lines straight. Uh, you'll see. So the first thing we're going to do is apply our base color. I obviously am very messy with this. I'm not worried about being pretty. It's all going to change. I like to lay in a lot of the, you know, I'm mixing with white here um, in a minute. So I like to lay in the warmer tone and kind of work backwards from there or the, uh, the color, whatever color I'm using. That's good enough. Spray bottle. My paint's a little bit old, so it doesn't move quite as well as I'd like it to. So then we're gonna take some white. I'm just gonna start laying in white right over top of the yellow. Now what we don't want to do is completely mix the white in. The point of this is that we have varying tones that are just going to happen naturally because both paints are wet and they're mixing on your canvas, your palette, your furniture. This can happen in one step or it can happen in two. As you see, I put a little bit too much water down here, perhaps, and I can start to see some of my underlayer through. Um, this is why you want to make sure that you prime your surface in white first. It doesn't have to be white. It could be slop paint, you know, if you have just some junk paint laying around, but you want to start with a primed surface. That way, if, if I do put on the paint a little bit too thin, you won't see whatever is underneath of this. If you're repainting a furniture piece and it's already got some sort of stain or paint on it. You want to make sure you sand that off with some 80 grit sandpaper before you prime. So if you can see here, I have a little curve, you know, we have a natural curvature. So to mitigate that, I kind of spread my legs apart and I'm just going to kind of slide from left to right and then back. And that'll help you keep your line straight. If you have any issue with it, you could um, you know, use the table as a guide. You know, you start from one edge, get one, you can go in one direction, you can go in both directions, however it works for you, but you want to make sure that this is relatively straight. And don't forget to run off to the edges. I don't want any abrupt starts or stops. So I'm pretty happy with that. I think I'm going to let this dry. These are great, by the way. These are deli cups that I bought off of Amazon for like 15 bucks for 50 of them. They come with lids, uh, and I use that to store all of the paint that I have in my studio. Uh, you can put it in gallons, but the small, you know, I don't have a lot of paint in here, so all that air is just going to dry out the paint over time. So the smaller containers are better than say using a gallon for that amount of paint which if you, you'd come back in a week and you'd have dry paint um, so i'm going to go ahead and let this dry don't rush it i know it's tempting i often try to rush my paint processes and it always you know i'm kicking myself in the end so we're going to be patient we're going to put a fan on it and we'll check back in in a little bit all right friends so my surface is now dry it took almost two hours of course i picked the day that's you know 90 percent humidity to try to do a painting which just prolongs the time. Um, so all I've done here is left it just as it was and added uh, just this piece of tape down the center. I'm gonna show you a few different methods so you don't need the tape obviously for yours. I'm just marking out different, different sections. So all I've done here 
hopefully you can see this. This is two versions, two different darknesses of essentially the same color. The same two colors were mixed in it. Um, just one has, this is an orange, more orangey one, and this is a more blue one. All I did was, because I was out of brown, I mixed my complementary colors of uh, blue and orange. I chose this one because it gives you like a chocolatey brown, which is pretty typical of wood grain. Um, now in this picture, it pretty much just looked black. Uh, I don't generally use black when I paint. The color I prefer is Van Dyke Brown, which is so brown that it's kind of black, but it's not really. Uh, when you use black against some of these surfaces, it can get a little muddy looking when it's done. I, I don't know, it's just because you never really know what's in black. A lot of times it could be blue based, it could be red based. If you mix something that's dark in color, um, that's like black, you know what, what colors are in it and you know how they're going to interact with other colors that you put on top of it. So let's see what we mean. So the first thing I'm going to do is grab my chip brush that I cut some hairs out of and just test it and see whether or not I like the, the pattern that it lays down. Uh, so I'm going to take a little bit of paint, right? Make sure you get most of the paint off of it. This is a dry brush technique which means that we're working with a relatively dry brush. So, and then, you know, you're gonna lay it flat when you apply your grain. And we're just gonna kinda keep in mind that we have to stay parallel when we start doing this. You know, something like that. So I'm not terribly unhappy with that. <laughs> um, I'm gonna keep this by because sometimes it helps to have something that can absorb a little bit of the initial paint. Um, and since that's unprimed wood, it just sucks up the, the little droplets so that I don't end up with, you know, essentially I don't end up with little drops all over my thing, which if you do, it's easy enough to fix, but, um, and again, so this, this photo only has one color wood grain. Since we're not going for realism here, and I think that having multiple grain colors is a little bit more visually interesting, we're going to go and use the darker version and the lighter version and kind of apply them at the same time, but we're not gonna blend them the way we did with the base coat. So take, and you can also use the edge of your cup, obviously. A little dab here, good. So I'm gonna use, I guess since I kind of arbitrarily placed this center line, I'm gonna use that as my straight line rather than use the edge of the board. again, feet shoulder length apart, I'm going to lean to this side, and this is over-exaggerated, but it, it will help in the long run. And I'm just going to place it down, lean to the right, flip my brush over, lean to the right. Now the reason I started here instead of here, if you can see, there's these droplets where I caught the edge of the board. That's okay, but we don't want it to look like the edge of the board we started on the whole time. So I may jump over here and then I stop short and then I come back, you know? And as it starts to run out of paint, I kind of just run my brush out a little more freely. So then we're gonna choose my second color. See how thick that paint is? If you lay that right down, boom, you got nice dark spots that you now gotta figure out how to mitigate. Now these colors are so similar that you may not actually be able to see that they're different, but they are, you know, just, it's just a little variation in color just to make it a little bit more visually interesting. I can also take, this is raw umber, which is a green brown used by making, mixing green and red. So I could, if I wanted to, add a little bit of that on top and I'll just show you what it is. Oh, I'm sorry. So I, I forgot to tell you that I thinned down this paint a little bit. And you're going to say, well, how much did you thin it down? <sighs> Enough that it would spread the way I wanted to. It's kind of dependent on how thick your paint was to begin with, what kind of paint you're using. Uh, you don't want to thin it too much because it'll just become a muddy mess. But you want it to be more liquid than solid. Like if you imagine a brand new acrylic paint, you probably want it to be about half of the viscosity of that. I hope that's helpful. Um, when I was taught how to do this, we use things like, oh, um, milk. So 
Is it whole milk? Is it 2% or is it skim milk? In this case, if we consider full paint to be twice of whole milk, it's about the whole milk consistency. If I were to thin it again it would, to about the same, it would be about the 2%. If I were to thin it again, it would be skim milk. So in this case, we're working with whole milk consistency. So a little, little dab. And now you notice I haven't washed my brush. I, at this point, we really don't care. It's just a little bit of just a little bit of sexiness, a little mixing. We don't care. It's supposed to be fun. Come on. Nobody's going to tell you that your wood grain doesn't look right, unless it, unless you really mess it up. But okay. So back to my reference picture. We're kind of working off of this side. Yeah, that's not too bad. One thing you can do, and be very careful when you do this, have a pretty dry, clean brush, just with a tad bit of water in it. I'm even going to, as Bob Ross would say, shake the devil out of it. And then I'm just going to kind of go over some of this paint that's still a little wet. And just blend it out just a little bit. Just a little bit. And I know it seems silly that I'm rocking back and forth, but trust me, it will help. If you just use your arm, you're going to create an arc. You want to use your whole body so that you can move through the stroke. Okay. So, see how this is bleeding just a little bit and we're getting some of that brown to mix into the yellow that we put underneath? That's a little bit of what I want to go for. And, it, you know, make sure you sample this. Get yourself a piece of scrap, whatever, and do this same treatment and get it the way you want it. And then, stick to it that's the that's maybe the hardest part is that sometimes you know we get, get in the habit of figuring it out and then while we're on the fly we're like oh but i could do this sample it first because you don't want to ruin all the hard work you did and have to start back at zero i decided after my second failed attempt on the first board with this wood grainer to go ahead and just switch to a neat new board um i'm pretty sure that the board that i was using has sealer underneath of it because I use it over and over again and I think that I didn't sand it down well enough and that just caused the paint to not bond well to the surface um, so I've got a new panel that I prepped well prep your panels well prep your piece whatever you're doing well make sure you sand off all joint compounds smooth the surface yada 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 um, so we're going to give this another go again we're going to use this uh, we're going to use this in like a rocking motion so you'll see, but so I'm going to go ahead and spray down the surface a little bit with some water. Got my watered down paints. So I'm going to start on my edge here. I'm just going to start pulling and rocking back and forward. Eh, that's not perfect, but it's better than it was. Again, so you see these portions here are caused by hitting the thumbprint portion of our uh, wood grainer. I have this upside down. Um, so the thumbprint, I'm sorry, the, the thumbprint type portion is what gives us these nice little round bits. And then this is when you're dragging from the long side. i to move a little bit quicker because I don't want my paint to dry. All right. Yeah, pretty sexy, huh? 
And I started here instead of on the edge, similar to the thing with the dry brushes that I don't want it to all look like I started from one location. I want to offer a little bit of variation. And since there's so much water in this paint, um, or at least on the surface, that happened right there. Sorry, I'm um, just, there's a little raised edge here and I caught that with the brush, with the uh, wood graining tool and that's why it skipped. That will occasionally happen. Um, try to pr try to flatten your surface down all the way if you can. If not, it's a, you know, it's just a little blip. Probably just take my rag, dab it out a little bit. And then these actually have these spikes on it. So, if you turn this around, you can just kind of pull it out with those spikes. I never find that those work too well, but it's supposed to be similar to the dry brush technique that we did with the chip brush. See that? <clears throat> that dried a little bit faster than I really wanted it to. I'm pretty happy with that. And a little bit I could add in there, and I could go back and do that later. I could do it now, um, but it doesn't bother me. Especially if we're looking at, you know, you, you can think of this as boards or you can think of it as plywood. That it's, they're going to be treated a little bit different if you if you do them as boards. But there are areas that don't have veining. So I wouldn't worry if you don't catch every single spot. So uh, that's the wood graining tool. It's really fun. Uh, I definitely recommend you check it out if you have, the, if you have a Lowe's nearby or if you order it online. Uh, it's a lot of fun to work with. And if you weren't doing wood grain you know i've thought about experimenting with you know fancy fun colors you know you could it doesn't have to be a yellow board and and brown wood it could be blue and orange it could be whatever you want it to be um, experiment have some fun with it maybe you can make some wacky tie-dye wood grain uh, so with that i'm back to my inevitable drying stage uh, and we'll i want to do the next step um, to both of these things and this one is going to need maybe an hour or so to dry. We're going to start talking about some top coats. So the only thing that I've done off camera is I took my brown color and my green color. Um, they're both kind of brown. Um, this one's my chocolatey brown. That's my green brown. And I've watered it down. So these just have water in them. And then, so that's called a wash. And we're going to work with different washes on these surfaces. And then in this one, I have a glaze. This is some red paint that I mixed up that I had laying around uh, mixed with sealer. The advantage uh, I find, I prefer usually to do washes because it's a little easier if you want to add something on top. Uh, you, if you put glaze on and I wanted to add another layer on top of it, I would also have to make that a glaze because the water won't stick on top of the glaze. Whereas if I use the water-based ones, I can kind of get it just the way I want it and then put sealer on it. Uh, but I have done it both ways depending on the application, so I just wanted to go over both of them. So I've got my two different types of wood graining here, and we're gonna go on a couple of different types of washes. Uh, so I'm gonna start with this green, green-brown. Just lay it in, it's a little dark, that's all right. That gives you one feel. On this side, we try the brown. Oh yeah. And this is what I mean about working through your layers in your head. We're getting closer now to the idea that this wood tone is underneath of here, but because we're putting that wash on top, we have to keep that in mind as we're moving. If I were to paint that brown underneath and then put a brown top coat over it, as you can imagine, that would probably become pretty muddy. So there we have our green, we have our brown. We're gonna do the same thing over here.
So the point of this is to show you how you can get varying tones, or not varying tones, but you can um you can very much change what your wood is with this top coat. You know, if you wanted to do a cherry wood, you could use something maybe not quite this color, but that idea. Um, and you, I also want to let this dry, and then we're going to apply the brown over top of it, so that you can see what happens when you do multiple washes. Um, and you know, this is a little heavy. I think if you're going to do two washes, you probably want to make it a little bit uh, thinner. Which you know, instead of remixing my whole thing, I'll just spray this with a little bit of water, clean my brush out, beat the devil out of it, and just pull away a little bit of that pigment. Now I will say a word on washes, uh, and this is where the glaze is, has a little bit of an upper hand. If you buy hardware store paint, I often find that when you try to water down hardware store paint to this viscosity, uh, sometimes the pigments can get weird and they can start drifting on you and stuff. These are acrylic paints, so I don't usually have that type of problem with these. So just something to keep in mind when you're shopping for paint um, and when you're deciding how you're going to paint your thing. So the next step, I talked about this in the last video. This is actually a, a, a pad, like kind of like a sponge that's used for applying stain to decking, but we often use it to apply sealer or to apply a glaze. So we're gonna use that idea. This is the same thing, but on a much smaller level. And fill that full of paint. And all we're gonna do, that's a little too thick. Add a little bit more sealer to this. This is why sampling is important. Um, I'm not doing a finished product, so I didn't actually sample these, uh, which is why, as you can tell, it's, uh, it's too thick. Let's try that again. And you can spread it out pretty well because it has uh, sealer in it when it's kind of acts as its own source of water Now when you're doing this you want to try to make sure that you keep your lines nice and even nice and parallel Because uh, it still does have kind of a grainy effect and if you if you start arcing You're gonna see it in your finished product All right, I think that's probably a decent That now you can, if you want to, do a wash and then put a glaze over it. But you cannot put a glaze and then put a wash over it. You would have to do a second glaze. Oh yeah, now we're, th now we're thinning out. I'll just show you what that looks like. Why not? So for both of these items, I think we're probably going to need about an hour to dry. It is fairly humid down here. Um, I can't turn a fan on because I put the sealer on this side. I know I discussed this in the last video, but I'm going to mention it again. If you're using water, you can turn a fan on it. Just make sure it's not directly pointed at it because you don't want it to start to push your pigment around if you have too much uh, water on your surface. But because there's sealer in this, if I were to turn a fan onto it, there's a high likelihood that the sealer will become cloudy as the top layer dries fast and then the moisture that's underneath pretty much just gets trapped uh, and you can you can ruin a project like that and, and set yourself back so i'm not going to turn a fan on it all i'm going to do is leave it dry as it is and we'll check back in about an hour all right so we've returned and our surfaces are dry so real quick in the interest of time i just want to show you these last couple of steps uh, so on top of the greener raw umber wash, we're going to put our burnt umber wash. This is our burnt umber, this is our raw umber, and I just want to give you a little section just to see what happens if you put one over top of the other. So that's a much richer color, there's more depth to it. This is what I prefer about washes. It's a little harder to get this done with glazes. Um, it all depends on the thing you're going for. You know, sometimes you may not need to do several washes. Maybe you just want to look like this. So I'm going to do the same thing over yonder. 
just so you can see. Huh? Huh? Not bad, right? All right, and then the next step that I wanted to show you was if you put a wash down and then you put a glaze over it. So I haven't been down here for maybe two hours, so you want to make sure you stir all your stuff up. And just, just as a really quick color theory lesson, this is a really almost rich brown. And the reason that is, even though that this is kind of a green and this is kind of red, is those are complementary colors. So they're actually trying to mix down to be a brown. Um, so something to keep in mind, talking about, again, working, looking and seeing through those layers so that you can determine what your finished product is going to be. If you make... And certainly I could just go ahead and, and do something that brown, but it's not going to have the same type of depth to it. Um, so think about that when you're working through your project. All right. Let's see how we did, huh? Not too bad. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and let this dry, and then I'm going to put some sealer on it. I'm probably not going to film that portion. I'll just include a picture when I'm done. Um, you can apply sealer with a brush. This is going to give you a little bit less of an even surface, but it kind of helps to accentuate the grain. I would always recommend doing two coats if you can. If you're really brave, you can do a light sanding in between. Just be very careful not to bake up any of your paint layers. Or if you want it to be super, super smooth and look pretty, or not that the first one doesn't look pretty, um, you can use the sealer pad. And you, same way that we did with the other one, you're just going to use regular sealer. Keep your direction in mind. Try to stay really parallel. And again, second coat of sealer if you have the time. So that's all I got for you here. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that video. Um, I know we weren't really working on one particular project, but the point I want to make here is that you can combine one or many of these graining techniques to come up with whatever type of wood you're using as your example. I certainly would recommend that if you are not used to uh, doing faux wood grain type treatments, that you use something, some visual image to keep you on track and, and base it in reality. Uh, the closer you stick to that idea, the better it'll look in the end. So, you know, have fun, experiment, be safe.